I want to make you a deal that you cannot refuse about loving your enemies. Hi, Joe McLean here, and I want to share with you a talk that I just gave the other night uh, to a group of teens at a local parish about loving your enemies. I'm going to share the story of Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres of Our Lady of Buen Successo de la Purificación, and it's going to be hopefully very inspirational to you. You're probably going to learn something about this story, this woman that you've never even heard of, and it's going to blow your mind. I mean, she died three times, not just once. She died three times. It's an amazing story. But what she was willing to do to save a soul from hell is going to literally just amaze you. So sit back and relax, enjoy this talk, and uh, I'll see you on the other side. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter five, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Praise be to Jesus in all things. I have come to make you a deal. I'm going to make you an offer you cannot refuse tonight. All right? I'm telling you, it's the deal of a lifetime. And you're probably going to jump all over it once I tell you. But before I tell you, I have to tell you a story. How many people like stories? Raise your hand. Yeah, I love stories. Praise be to God. In the year 1576, a 13-year-old girl named Mariana de Jesus Torres got on a boat to sail across the sea from Spain all the way to Ecuador. Nine Franciscan nuns and this 13-year-old girl were making their journey because the king of Spain, Philip II, wanted a Franciscan convent established in St. Francis de Quito in Ecuador, this Spanish colony. And he sent his very own cousin to start the process, to lead the way, to found a Franciscan convent. And this 13-year-old girl left her family she would never see again for the rest of her life to go to the unknown, to join this incredible adventure. When she was nine, she received an apparition, a, a private revelation that one day she would become a Franciscan nun. So by 13, no one could stop her. She was so anxious and eager. But on that journey in 1576, the storm raged, and the, and the boat was being tossed, and everybody was afraid that they would sink. And this young little 13-year-old girl, Mariana de Jesus Torres, received a vision of a seven-headed dragon that came up out of the sea and was threatening to destroy the ship. And this dragon began to speak in this diabolic voice, I will not allow this convent to be established. I will persecute it over and over. I will crush it. I will not allow for it. And then came a bright light, a woman. In her left hand was the infant child, Jesus, who beckoned her to destroy and smote the dragon. And so she did with her right hand. This very image of, the, of Our Lady would become the image of these nuns. And they wear this image on their habits to this very day. This would only be the beginning of an incredible life of Mariana de Jesus Torres. By 1584, when she's taking her perpetual vows, this woman is already uh, expressing some very remarkable, very remarkable spiritual activity. One day... When she was praying, she received a vision. The, the crucifix came alive. And our Lord gave her a very special offer. See, three swords appeared above the head of our Lord and Savior Jesus. 
Uh, there's the crucifix there. You can see it. Imagine three swords. And on those swords were uh, impurity, heresy, and blasphemy. Right? Think about that for a second. Three swords hanging above our Lord's head while he's suffering on that cross, alive before this young woman. She's 19 at this point. These three swords of heresy, impurity, and blasphemies. And our Lord says, I'm going to give you a deal. I'm going to offer you the crown of glory. And it's beautiful. And it's incredible. Awe-inspiring and beckoning the soul home to heaven. Or I'm going to give you the crown of lilies, but with thorns. Which means a life of suffering, of difficulty, and hardship. If she chose the crown of glory, she would have gone to heaven and been forever in eternity in the beatific vision, no pain, no suffering, no crying, no nothing. If she chooses the crown of lilies with thorns, she stays on earth and she suffers. Now she asked, she asked the Blessed Mother who was also present in the room, did I cause this suffering? Because she's looking at our Lord hanging on the cross in utter agony. And our mother says to her, no, my child, no, no, no. These are from the sins of this world. But I would ask you, my dear child, to consider as I have the crown of lilies with thorns, to join me in the suffering for others. Little Mariana de Jesus Torres, now 19 years old, chooses the crown of lilies with thorns, and guess what happens? I mean, the heart of Our Lady, Queen of Heaven and Earth, the most beloved, blessed mother, smiling at the wonderful, incredible, heroic, and virtuous choice of this 19-year-old girl. And then those three swords of impurity and heresy and blasphemy these three swords come down and they don't they don't leave no they come and they strike young Mariana in the heart and they kill her dead and she goes to her judgment and she is judged because in the end when we die we go to our judgment we face the choices we made in this life Mariana was found to be perfect. And so she died, and her body lay dead in her chapel as she goes through this incredible journey. The doctor comes and pronounces her dead. The Franciscan superior comes and pronounces her dead. They are mourning her loss, preparing for her funeral when she comes back to life. This will be but the first time she will die. There are two more to come. Again, this is just the beginning. You see, once this convent gets up and running, you have the nine foundresses that came from Spain. They're called the mothers. So once Mariana takes her vows, she is called Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres. And she would become Mother Superior. Eight times in total before she finally dies permanently uh, you know, at the end, which I'll get to. But along the way, locals from, from Ecuador, the natives, they come and they join this convent, and it's growing leaps and bounds, and it's beautiful and incredible. Mother Mariana is receiving instruction from her spouse, Jesus Christ, personally in apparitions all the time. Well, the locals who become sisters are nuns, because nuns are cloistered, sisters aren't. And the ones from Spain, a division breaks out in the convent. The ones from Spain want to live the rule, the Franciscan rule. And they want to do so as the rule is laid out the way it's intended. The locals don't want to do that. In fact, they lobbied to have the Franciscan uh, supervisors from the, from the male side kicked out. And they wanted the, the bishop, the local bishop, to be the one in charge. But that was not what Our Lady of Heaven wanted. And she warned Mariana that this would happen. And so this division in the family broke out into what we might think of as like a civil war. It got so bad 
that the nuns who did not want to live the rule, they were called the non-obedient nuns, they would lie about Mother Mariana. They would spread lies and rumors about her. They would say things like, she is stealing, she is, uh, you know, she is hanging out with the male side of the Franciscans a little too much. She's doing things she's not supposed to do. Well, they would tell the local bishop what's going down. The local bishop apparently just believed whatever they told him because he simply imprisoned Mariana. In fact, she would be imprisoned no less than three times during her life and her time in Quito, Ecuador. And so while she's in prison, she's not allowed to go to Mass. She's not allowed to go to confession. She's not allowed to pray the office. But guess what? Not one single time did she cry or complain. Did she say, woe is me? When she was unjustly lied about, rumors spread about her. She accepted everything that came her way as though it came from the hand of her beloved spouse, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Well, these non-observant nuns weren't happy with things, and they were never happy with uh, Mariana in particular. So even though Mariana was let out eventually, they would lie about her again and spread more rumors about her again, and she would be imprisoned yet again. Over and over it went, and it got really, really bad. They wanted these Spanish nuns to leave and go back to Spain, and they wanted to live a very lukewarm life in the convent. They wanted it for themselves. Well, there was one nun in particular who led the way against Mother Mariana. She was called the Commandress. Now, the Commandress was particularly vile in her efforts to subvert these foundress nuns. And so she was really trying. And the problem was she was possessed, and she had given herself over to the devil and to the demons that harassed her. And Mother Mariana knew this because she could hear and see you know, it's like Padre Pio over there. He could see his guardian angel. How many of you can see your guardian angels? Raise your hand. Gabriel, can you see yours? Where are you at, Gabriel? He's not even raising his hand. What's that tell you? Right? Padre Pio got so mad at his guardian angel one time because the demons beat him. He refused to look his guardian angel in the eye. Like, where were you? You're supposed to be taking care of me. And he just turned his head on his guardian angel. Could you imagine? Our Lady, uh, you know, the stories of Our Lady as a little girl, probably saw her guardian angel all the time, let alone many angels and demons and all kinds of things. People who live intimately close with the most sacred heart of Christ, uniting their will to God's, they're going to see these things. And Mother Mariana is one of those souls. So she could see the demons that harass this commandress, this non-observant nun. And the vileness, the, the, the ugliness that came out, of her, came out of her mouth all the time. Well, it became clear to the bishop what was going down in this convent. And he had to get himself involved, and he showed up personally to try to ascertain and, and help and figure out the situation. And it was the commandress that got thrown in prison this time. But she was now so close to despair that she wanted to commit suicide because the voices in her ear were telling her to do it, and she was so given over to them she was listening. Mother Mariana was not willing to give up on them, not willing to give up on that commandress, and vowed to help her. And so the Lord came to her in the 1590s and gave her a deal, an offer she could not refuse. The Lord said, that woman, that nun, is going to die soon, and she is going to be judged, and she is going to hell for all eternity. But I will give you a chance to change all that and save her soul. Mother Mariana, what I need from you, my daughter, is I need you to offer up your life for five years. I need you to go through the pains of hell. I need you to be in hell for five years. If you will do that, if you will unite your heart to mine, on the cross for five years she will end up in purgatory till the end of time but she will end up in heaven forever are you willing to do this think about that she was told 
during this five-year period, there would be zero consolation. Somebody comes up to you, your best friend, and they smile. And they're like, oh, I can't wait to sell you. You're so awesome. I love you. You're amazing. I can't. And gives you a big hug. How many people like big hugs from their friends? You love it, right? Who doesn't? How many people like saying, man, you are awesome. I can't believe what you did. That was incredible. Oh, that's amazing. We love that, right? We love it when our parents affirm us. We love it when our friends affirm us. Mother Mary and I was told, nothing will console you. You will be miserable. Nothing. Not even receiving the Blessed Sacrament at the Holy Eucharist at Mass will console you. None of your prayers, none of your sisters, nothing. You will be desolate in every way, shape, or form, and you will be harassed for five years in agony and misery. For five years, it will be hell. But if you don't do this, this woman will go to hell for eternity. Are you willing? She said yes. She said yes. She was told, good, this is what's going to happen. She's going to die and be judged. And she will see everything. And the fact that she deserves hell and then she will see your sacrifice for her, and she will come back. She will be deathly sick, and you will nurse her back to health. And then, and then, your five years begins. Mother Mariana died right then and there. This was the second time she would die, not the last. She was dead this time for three days. She dies on a Friday. She rises on a Sunday. Guess what? Remember that doctor that came the first time she died? He refused to come back this time. He was like, oh, I ain't going back. Are you kidding me? She's probably not dead dead. She's only mostly dead. How many people have seen Princess Bride? Right? <laughs> like, she's not dead dead. She's only mostly dead. She was dead three days. When they found her in the upper choir loft praying, they thought she was a ghost, and it freaked everyone out. But she was real and she was alive again. But guess what? The commandress, this non-observant nun, this woman possessed by the devil himself, she died. She sees her judgment, and she realizes what she's facing. But when she comes back, here's the kicker, she's still not converted. She's still not happy. She's still miserable. And she gets deathly sick, and Mother Mariana nurses her. This woman tosses feces on Mother Mariana. Every day Mother Mariana shows up and vileness comes out of her mouth, spittle and other bodily fluids, and Mother Mariana doesn't bat an eye. She doesn't stop helping. She doesn't get mad. She doesn't lose her temper. She just is there every day, day in and day out, until this woman has recovered. And that is the moment this woman is converted. But that is also the moment the Mother Mariana's hell begins. One of the other nuns whispers so that the infirmarian comes up to Mother Mariana and is like, I, we know what the deal is. How do you know? I didn't tell you. Jesus told us. He whispered in communion to a several nuns so that they would know that the next five years, don't hold it against Mother. Don't hold it against her. It's her five years of hell. And five years of hell, I want to read just a, a tiny little section of one of the books that I got some of this information out of. When she thought about the sacrifice that she had made for her sister, instead of love, she felt fury and complete lack of confidence in God. Intellectually, she remembered all the mysteries of the redemption, but these remembrances were for her now a source of annoyance and despair. She understood who God and the Virgin were and what heaven was, but she felt that for everything was definitively finished with no hope of possessing them. The notion of five years had disappeared from her mind. She only perceived that she was condemned forever. Harsh voices whispered to her, eternity, eternity, forever, forever. A nun 
who wasted her time deserves the most horrible punishment, the diabolical voices would whisper. Externally, she was a model of sweetness, humility, and kindness, and observance of the rule, but her happiness and had disappeared, and her countenance had a deathly sadness. Her rosy color was now yellowish, and her eyes sunken, and she had lost weight. By the time the five years was coming to an end, she was the walking dead. But it did come to an end. But it did come to an end. I wonder, I want you to stop for a second. Just take one moment. And I want you to, in your mind, I want you to be thinking about your enemy. Who is the enemy for you? Who is that person in your mind that, oh, oh I'd, I'd kick him in the shins if I could. Step on the toe. Flatten the tire. Worse. That person maybe, I don't know, that person that you're like, I can't believe they got that. Are you kidding? How, they don't deserve that. I deserve that. Maybe there's that person that's like weird, awkward, socially, you know, not great. And you, I, yeah, yeah, thank you, but no, thank you. I'm going to, uh, you know, you don't talk to them. You avoid them. You give them no time of day. They don't look like you, they don't act like you, they don't talk like you, they don't hang out with your friends, they don't do the things you do. Or maybe they're the person that is like the total opposite of you. Socially, politically, ideology, I, whatever. Who is the enemy for you? If today, if this very moment, our Lord and our Lady came down here and they looked you right in the eye and they said, are you willing to suffer in hell for five years so that that person who's in your mind right now, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a friend at school, maybe it's the kid down the block, I don't know. Are you willing to suffer for that? I wonder how many of us in this room would take that deal. I wonder. Because hell is real and people go there. More people go to hell than more people go to heaven. Think about this for a second. God is so credible. He is so merciful. He is such a loving father that he would allow a hell to exist so that people who hate him, revile him, and want nothing to do with him have a place to go. And they suffer in their misery from a loving father forever. What does it take to go to hell? One mortal sin. What constitutes a mortal sin? Grave matter? You have to know it's a mortal sin and you have to choose to do it anyway. You die in a state like that, you send yourself to hell. If we all make it to heaven, but that enemy, the one in our minds that we're thinking about, they end up in hell, how is that right? What if God sent you? What if God made and fashioned you before you were ever born, a millennia ago, knowing that you were the one chance you are the one chance that might be available to help that one person have a conversion. Because as God says in Ezekiel 13, he, he wishes not the death of the sinner, but that he may be converted and live. And when Jesus said to those Jews there in the first century, you have heard that it was said, love your enemy, but hate your... No, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, right? Right? Where in the Old Testament does it say to hate one's enemy? Any Bible scholars in the room? It doesn't. Our Lord is calling them out. He is laying down the law. You have heard it was said to hate your enemy. Boy, I got to tell you what. You know where that comes from? 
when Joshua and Caleb, the only two to survive from Egypt into the promised land, all of their generation dead in the desert from their hardness of heart, from their stiff necks, worshiping a golden calf, a pagan idol, and only Joshua and only Caleb make it to the promised land. And what do they do? They slaughter the Canaanites. Why? Because plan A was to convert them. What happened? Why did we go to plan Z? Because the golden calf. Because God set them apart. Why? Does God not love the Canaanites, the Pezzarites, the Hittites, the Jebusites? Does he not like these ites? Does he only love the Israelites? Let me tell you something. God loves every human being on planet Earth. There are no exceptions to the rule. Every single human person, no matter where they live and what circumstances they find themselves in, they are his precious and his children. And do not be mistaken about this. God loved them so much. He loved those pagan Egyptians. He loved those pagan Canaanites. He loved them so much that he took Israel up out of the land and he consecrated them apart for himself to send them back, to convert them, to bring back his lost sons and daughters. But these stiff-necked, these hard-hearted Israelites, they sit there in the desert and they wanted that Egyptian paganism again. Miracle after miracle. It made no diff. What does it take for God to get through your hard heart? What has he got to do? Transform bread and wine into his flesh and blood? I don't know, how about every single day? Manna come down from heaven for you. And those Israelites, they hardened their heart. And they said to those non-Israelites, Goyin dogs. They called them Goyin dogs. How many of you remember that passage in the gospel where our Lord in Gentile country encounters the Syrophoenician woman, the, this woman who is not Israelite. She is a Goyin dog. And this woman is begging, begging the Lord of heaven and earth, please heal my daughter. Please cast out the demon from my daughter. And what does Jesus say? It is not right to give the food for the children and give it to the dogs. Our Lord just called her a dog. But what does the woman say? <laughs> Lord, even the dogs eat from the scraps of the children's table. And our Lord's like, because of your faith, you can go. Your daughter is healed. Do you see that, Israelites? Even the Goyim dogs have more faith than you. Even they have more faith and humility than you. St. Paul would say in his letter to Timothy, God desires all men to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. I think of the great saints like uh, St. Rita, whose husband was, he was a dirtbag, I'm going to be honest with you, a very abusive dirtbag. And she endured the suffering and converted him and he died in a state of grace. And he gets to go to heaven because his wife was willing to suffer. I think of Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mori, kind of the same situation. I think of uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, who offered her own sacrifice and suffering as a victim soul, suffering through tuberculosis for the conversion of prisoners condemned to die. Because better them to go, to go to the gallows and then go to heaven than to live another 80 years on earth and go to hell. I think of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Where's my man St. Max? Over there. St. Maximilian Kolbe giving his life for a Jew so that that Jew could go on to live. And he did. He went on to live. And guess what? One month before that Jew died, he was right here in Houston, Texas at visiting St. Maximilian Kolbe Catholic Church. That man made sure of it. God desires all men to be saved. David, King David, had a chance to kill King Saul and would not raise his hand against that guy who was a pagan. 
He was a, a necromancer. He was a liar. He was a cheat. And he was fully possessed. And David still would not raise his hand in to smite, justfully some would say, this, this man saw. When he, God gave him into his hand, he, he, oh, it would have been, been easy. But David's like, I ain't doing it. And when Saul finally dies on the battlefield, his son killed him, by the way, because uh, he asked him to. And then a messenger comes running to David to tell David, hey, David, guess what? I got good news. Saul's dead now. David's like, did I just see a gleam in your eye? Are you happy that the king of Israel is dead? And then David kills the messenger because it was not right to be joyful over the death of Saul. It's real. Let me, let me tell you something, though, that's very personal. I work full-time in Catholic evangelization. I have been since 2008. It's, I do it 24-7. It's my everything. But the last several months, I cannot tell you how much I have agonized in the confessional as to whether or not I truly have a love for the souls of those people out there. Do I really love them? Do I want them to go to heaven? Because if one more people cut me off in traffic in their big pick em up truck, let me tell you something, right? It's, it's, it's called a turn signal. They managed to invent this technology to let people know what's go up and what's going down. It will not cause COVID, I promise you. I wonder, because, you know, I can get on the radio and I can talk a good game. I can be here in front of you and talk a good game. But do I love my neighbor? Is my neighbor going to heaven? I mean, I'm talking about the physical neighbor, the guy next to my house. Is that guy, that gal, are they living in mortal sin? How much do I actually love? How much zeal do I really have? Because if I go to my judgment and my Lord is like, you know, I kind of put you in the path of about, I don't know, 10,000 people and I see three behind you, what happened? Did I have the courage to act, to act charitably, to speak charitably, to act lovingly, to be there? You know, the problem with loving your enemy is that our God tells us in Matthew's gospel that if you are to be perfect, a child of the Father, you will forgive your enemies. He'll go on to say in uh, Matthew chapter 7, which is just another few paragraphs later, that unless you forgive, you will not be forgiven. So we sit here and we think, oh, this is all great, it's all wonderful. Yeah, uh-huh, but how much do we hold the grudge? How much are we willing to do or not do? Do we actually have love? Do we actually believe that there will be a judgment coming and we will have to face that judgment? Should we live in fear? Guess who lives in fear? People who live in sin. If you're living in sin, you're going to live in fear. I'm so sorry. The antidote is the Holy Confession and the Blessed Sacrament. The two things that are incredibly powerful. You want more? But wait, there's more. You got more. You still got the baptism you already received, confirmation. Maybe some of you are about to be confirmed. Maybe some of you are confirmed. You got that, plus the confession, plus the Holy Eucharist. You want more? But wait, there's more. Holy Rosary. Think about the promises that come with this. How about the scapular? I mean, holy water, exercise salt, the miraculous metal. I mean, it goes on. Our God is so good that he has given you a mountain of opportunities, of grace to overcome your faults. You live in sin, you live in fear. Bottom line. You live in a state of grace, what do you got to worry about? You live as though everything depends upon God. The moments he gives us in the day, you have nothing to fear. But that sounds stuffy, Joe. I mean, I want to have a good time. I really want to hang out with my friends and be accepted and just kind of go along, you know, get along. I, I get that. 
We all love our friends. We love the jokes we have and the activities we do. We like being among people who love us. But our Lord says in Matthew's Gospel, what credit is that to you? If all you do is hang out with people who love you. What credit is that to you? God does not put you on this planet. Breathe life into your body so that you can spend the next 80, 85, all right, 90, 95. I mean, how many people want to be 100 years old? Uh, you do, really? You, uh, man, think about how bad your bones are going to be. Think, you know what I mean? Like, give me good 75, let's do this thing. 8, 95, 100? I have a hard time walking now. <laughs> However long God put you on this earth, it's not just to have a good time. Yeah, there's fun. There's going to be fun. Praise be to God. But that's not all. And if that's all you want is a good time and great success, your life is going to be shallow and weak, and you're going to be dissatisfied. But Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be ye perfect. That is in connection to what? Loving your enemy. When your enemy lies about you, do you lie back? No. No, you don't. When your enemy is dirty, do you give dirt back? No. No, you don't. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. St. Chrysostom would say, step one, be content. Be content. Accept whatever comes your way. If someone has come and they have humiliated you or they have mistreated you, you don't have to hang out with them. You don't have to stay in their presence continuing the abuse. No, 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 separate, separate. But offer that up. If eye for an eye, that means equal. But how often do we really want an eye for an eye? Oh, no. Oh, no, sir. You are not just going to cut me off. I'm going to do you one, and I'm going to meet you and do one better. Right? We never want what we, what we were taken from. We want what we were taken from and then more. Always. So, so much for an eye for an eye. Be content, St. Chrysostom would say. Offer it up, St. Chrysostom would say. Give it up. Let go. Let go. Now, like I said a second ago, if you have people in your life that are toxic, they are toxic people. Why are you hanging out with toxic people? Why are you hanging out with people that are going to lead you astray? Putting ideas in your head. Why? Now, most of you in here are not going to be given the deal of five years in hell to convert them. Here's what you can do. You can offer up a sacrifice for them. You can put a pebble in your shoe. You can fast from a meal. You can pray an extra rosary. You can spend an hour in adoration. I mean, you can do all kinds of things. You can put down the video games for a whole month and offer that up for the conversion of your enemy. How many of you have actually suffered for someone who hates you? Raise your hand. Why isn't all of our hands up? Why not? I mean, you can put them down now, thanks. <laughs> I didn't mean to torture you. Offer that up, darn it. No, I'm kidding. In my own journey, there's a balance, right? I mean, there's, there's a balance. As Jesus rightfully did, calling them out about hating their neighbor. No, you got to love your neighbor. The problem is the messages you'll often receive are going to be one of two. How much time do I have left, Gabe? Seven hours. Got it. Okay. You're either going to receive one of two responses. You're going to see either one that says, burn him at the stake. Right? Give him the noose. Heresy! Pagans! Right? Blasphemers! Hypocrites! Burn them! That's one response. Then you get the other response. Oh, this is so much fun. Meet them where they're at. 
Yeah, let's do exactly what they're doing. We want to feel included in everything that they believe in. So they need to feel like we're right where they're with them. It's usually one or the other. But that's not what the church is teaching us. That's not what the church is telling us. The church doesn't want us to forego everything that we know to be right, true, and just and pretend like that's going to somehow convert people. Because of every statement that comes out like that, people continue to abandon the church in droves. I, I don't know the statistic, but I guarantee you, most of you might not be here Catholic by the time you graduate college. Look around the room. This may be the last time you see a friend in church. Well, that's what this message can do. Just smell like the sheep and do whatever they want you to do. It's fine. Everything is acceptable. That's not what the church teaches. Neither is it burn them at the stake. Heretics. That's not the answer either. The answer is up the middle, straight down the middle. Meet people where they are at. Try to understand them, their challenges, who they are, their background. Get to know them. They're never going to listen or have your seeds planted in their heart unless they think you're sincere and you actually care. Meet them where they're at. Take them where they got to go. That's what the church teaches. We meet people in the difficulties of life. Divorce and remarriage. My parents have been divorced and remarried probably 10 times between both of them. My heart was so broken, I duct tape wouldn't fix that darn thing. It took the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and miracles to bring me back from the depths of despair and suicide. I was addicted to pornography for 21 years. I committed the mortal sin of abortion. I committed so many mortal sins that I heard the voice of the devil telling me to kill myself. And then I heard the voice of our Lord said, you're my son and I love you. And I'll die for you again today if I could. If I was needed, it's not. Because I already did it. Right up the middle. Are you prepared to take the deal? There are people in your lives, souls, you may be their only chance. Lent is coming. I, I want to challenge you. I want to offer you a deal. I want you to tell no one, no one, tell no one, no one. But I want you to offer your Lent and sacrifice upon sacrifice. Just you, our lady, the Lord, and the guardian angel of your worst enemy. Offer your Lent for the conversion of your neighbor. It's a deal you can't refuse because we will be held accountable if we fail to do this deed. We have one purpose in this world, one purpose and one purpose only, to get to heaven and to get everybody around us there too. How much do you really love? Do you love enough to hate your neighbor? Or do you love enough to love your neighbor? God bless you. I'll be praying for your Lent and offering my sacrifices for you. Amen. Thanks for watching this video. If you're at this point, please do me a favor, hit that like, hit that subscribe, share this content, I'd be grateful to you. I host a live talk radio show Monday through Friday called Catholic Drive Time. It's heard on 52 stations around the nation, praise be to Jesus. And you can find more information in the link below or in the card up above. But uh, we'll see you on the next video. God bless you, God love you, and we'll see you then.